So for the past few years, I've been working on a project on revenge. Uh, and that project is going to manifest in May of this year, 2020, in a book from Pluto Books called Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. Uh, I try and do a number of different things in that book, uh, and there are a number of different sections. So the first, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in a minute, is a theorization of the radical politics of revenge and what revenge might have to offer us in this day and age when capitalism appears to be taking a needless, warrantless vengeance on humanity, and when, unfortunately, much of our radical thinking has been uh, stymied by what I call reconciliophilia, or a love of reconciliation. There's a chapter in the book about unpayable debt, the unpayable debts that are owed by many of us to banks, to financial institutions, the unpayable debts that are owed by many nations around the world, especially in the global south, that keep them in a kind of perpetual subservience to the sort of masters of the global economy, uh, but also the unpayable debts that we can't speak of, which are, is to say the unpayable debts of history for slavery, for settler colonialism, for injustice, for exploitation, that the powerful of the world don't even acknowledge or accept, but in fact are still motivating a lot of what occurs in our political landscape today, whether we admit it or not. So following the chapter on unpayable debts, there's a chapter about money, and it counters the sort of common neoliberal argument that money is an instrument or a technology of peace. I argue that money under capitalism has always been a technology of violence and a technology of a kind of systemic and structural revenge, by which I mean a kind of revenge that doesn't require that any one individual have a particularly malicious or... Uh, or uh, you know, horrific mindset. It's something that's enacted by systems, not by individuals, though individuals, of course, play their part in those systems. Following that, there's a chapter on the ongoing opioid epidemic, especially in the United States, and the rise of a revenge politics within that. Then there's a chapter on dead zones, which I uh, use as a metaphor for describing the way that the constant competition and financialized competition of capitalism today uh, delivers us into a world where more and more things become dead zones, zones denuded or uh, evacuated of life. And I take here the metaphor of the aquatic dead zone, where a influx of synthetic nutrition, like fertilizers, for instance, uh, allow for the bloom of uh, algae which blot out the light and kill the ecosystem underneath it. And I argue this is going on not only in ecosystems that are affected by sort of global capitalist speculation, but also in terms of things like gentrifying cities, which are hollowed out of their life as richer and richer and more people move in, or as urban space becomes a vehicle for uh, financial speculation. Or, for instance, the dead zone that forms within each of us thanks to the kind of way that our whole neurosocial system has been hacked by capitalism through the use of kind of predatory social media apps and smartphones and such. There's a conclusion, too, that asks, well, if we are going to admit that revenge is here among us in this moment of revenge capitalism, if we're going to admit that this form of revenge capitalism gives rise to right-wing and reactionary revenge politics, which I argue it does, then what is there for those of us who want something different? And I argue that against the idea that we should always embrace reconciliation, forgiveness, these sorts of tropes. We need to embrace a kind of avenging imaginary, what I call an avenging imaginary, which recognizes that though there are many people in the world, the sort of masters of the corporate universe, who do indeed deserve to be brought to justice for the horrible crimes they've perpetuated. For instance, all of those executives of, um, uh, of hydrocarbon corporations, oil companies, who for years knew about the reality of climate change, it did nothing to stop it, and in fact hid the evidence. Those people deserve to, have, to be brought to justice. However, revenge against individuals is largely ineffective because one of the incredible and powerful things about capitalism is every single member of that group is instantly replaceable by another. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are more than willing and capable to take their place. So revenge against individuals is perhaps justified, but it certainly will not create the transformation we need. If we want to have that transformation beyond a revenge system, we need to take up what I call an avenging imaginary, which recognizes that to truly have revenge for these horrible crimes that are being perpetuated in the past and in the present, and indeed likely in the future, we need to abolish the systems that empowered and enabled those people 
to enact such structural, systemic, and direct forms of violence. We need to avenge ourselves not on individuals, but on systems. And that requires an abolitionist approach, where we seek to destroy those systems in the present, but also as we are destroying them, as we are withdrawing our labor and our resources from those systems, we are also creating new systems, new patterns, new ways of cooperating, new economies to replace them, so that as we build the future, we will inherit exactly what we build as well.